Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Speed Force Media Podcast, a show where every week on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we talk about the best recap of the comic book movie news of the week. My name is Eleanor. And I'm Derek. And today, a few of our topics are, has James Gunn ruined his public perception? And also, the fact that Kevin Feige said that Ant-Man will be kicking off Phase 5. Stick around if you want to hear more. Welcome back, everyone, to another Speed Force Media podcast. How are you doing today, Derek? Doing swell. How are you? Doing just fantastic. we got a great show planned for you guys. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Let's get right into our very first topic. Marvel Studios President Kevin Feige has revealed why Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania was selected as the start of Phase 5 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Quote, we wanted to kick off Phase 5 with Ant-Man because he had earned that position, quote, Feige told Empire, to not simply be the backup or the comic relief, but to take his position at the front of the podium of the MCU. Added Quantumania director Peyton Reed, we're not running around the streets of San Francisco anymore. We're fighting one of the most powerful villains in Marvel history. Now, I love these comments. Um, I, I loved every trailer that we've seen from Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Almost said Avatar. Sorry about that. <laughs> There's too many movies that start with A. Ant-Man, Avatar, uh, Annabelle. Uh, uh, hush, hush. I love the Ant-Man movies. They're not like top 10 comic book movies of all time for me, but they were fun time, good time, always put a smile on my face. And who doesn't love Paul Rudd? I mean, he's one of the greatest castings for that character, I think, that there could have ever been. One of my favorite castings in the MCU. And I'm really looking forward to this third one. It's also really nice to see that we're getting the introduction to this new villain that we basically only saw just a little glimpse in Loki, the very end of it. And it was obviously a very different version of Kang that we're going to get moving forward but it's nice to see the introduction to Kang in an Ant-Man movie as opposed to the typical like Thor, Iron Man, Captain America, or even saving it for an Avengers buildup. They're introducing him in, you know, kind of a rather smaller character, which I think is, you know, it's a good it's a good decision. Uh, Kevin Feige stated multiple times that Jonathan Majors is his man, uh, that the man that he's going to put the MCU on his shoulders from a villain standpoint and that Kang the Conqueror is the perfect villain for the multiverse saga, and this is really where it's going to start off. Eleanor, what do you think of all those comments? Well, I think that Ant-Man is a good choice because we don't have very many of the OG Avengers or you know MCU cast hanging around. Ant-Man is one of those older characters that we have, especially if Thor goes by the wayside, if Liam Hemworth... Is it Liam Hemsworth? Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth. One of those brothers <laughs> decides that they're done being uh, Thor. Then all we have left really is Ant-Man for now that we really recognize other than Bucky and Falcon. And maybe Doctor Strange. But even those guys were phase two, you know. Right. Which so, Ant-Man was, I guess, as well. Right. So those guys will be the only ones that we really have left. And we haven't heard how much Doctor Strange is or isn't going to be in this. So we don't know if we're even going to see him as much. Whereas Ant-Man, I feel like we definitely have a for sure good sign that we're going to see him more often and he's going to be more prominent. And like you said, Paul Rudd is the perfect casting for this character. I haven't seen the Ant-Man movies in quite a long time, so my perspective on them might change. But I remember not really liking them as much yeah. the first time I saw them. Um, what is that guy's name that just was like, it's Truth Serum. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one that cracked me up every time. That's the guy oh that I was God. like, oh, I Michael need... Michael Pena's character. Yes. <laughs> um, I can't remember his name. But he was so funny. I just loved Michael Pena in that. I was like, okay, he wins. He wins the whole movie. And, I mean, I probably like the movie more now. But just when I saw it, I mean, I was just like, oh, I'm not really into this. And... Yeah, you know. you know. As you get older, perspectives change and humor changes and stuff like that. So 
but I am excited because I saw these trailers and the trailers look really good. And I'm like, well, we're in freaking phase five already of the MCU. I can't believe that. It feels like just yesterday we just had the phase three come out. So, I mean, they're chugging along with this and I'm excited to see where they take it. Um, especially because Kang I'm not familiar with at all. Like, I wasn't familiar with Thanos, and they made him intimidating, and I really enjoyed the character. So I'm like, how are you going to top that? So I'm excited to see where they take that and how Ant-Man's going to be the vehicle for that. Or at least in the beginning. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I would say that you're not alone in your criticisms of the Ant-Man movies. A lot of people think that they're just kind of childish, that they're just cheesy. Maybe the humor doesn't work for them, and I get that. One of the things that I've heard over the years with the Ant-Man movies is that you know, the stakes aren't really that high. And so they don't feel the sudden dread or the sudden urgency that you might get in some of the other comic book movies out there. But to me, it was actually a little bit of a relief, kind of refreshing at the time, because we had just gotten a couple Avengers movies. You know, right. we had already had the world at stakes. And in the first Ant-Man movie, the world is kind of at stake, even though... They're fighting in a little girl's bedroom on a train tracks. Right. Which is awesome. But I would say that the the level of stakes in those movies are definitely more street level versus cosmic threat. Um, That's kind of a refreshing. Is, yeah. Though. It's kind of more of a heist movie at, at, at times. Um, and I think that with this film, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, obviously we're going to get... In, a lot more into the quantum realm and it's probably going to be a lot more cosmic. So it'll be interesting to see if they can pull that off, if they're able to keep Ant-Man kind of, um, still grounded, maybe still grounded and make it as, ah, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it going to feel completely different than the first two Ant-Man movies? Kind of right. like Thor Ragnarok was a reimagining. Uh, right, reimagining. Like a complete departure from what it used to be. Right, and maybe that is what they're going to go with. Maybe Ant-Man is going to be less jokey in the future. Who knows? We'll see what they do. But what do you guys think? Are you excited for Ant-Man and the Gwas Quantumania? And moving on to our second topic. Sticking with Marvel for now. More Marvel movies are getting IMAX immersive sound in 2023. Now, this isn't a little bit older topic. This was a topic that came out a couple of weeks ago, and it's nothing incredibly new. There are Marvel movies on Disney Plus that have IMAX immersive sound, but in 2023, even more Disney Plus Marvel movies will be getting IMAX immersive sound. That being said, I am myself live in the dark ages... I am a physical media guy. I have, of course, multiple streaming services, but I'm guilty of collecting my fair share of Blu-rays, especially of my favorite films. But even I have to admit, none of my Blu-rays, unless there's a hidden Easter egg somewhere, <laughs> none of them have IMAX level sound. Um, one of the pros to physical media over, the lo over several years is that they claim... Uh, you got better picture. You got better sound. You don't got to worry about your internet going out. You don't got to worry about buffering or your vi uh, quality of your image uh, fluctuating throughout right. watching your film or your series. You don't have to worry about ads. You can just throw it on, and you don't got to hunt down which streaming service has the next movie you're watching. And a lot of these streaming services will have like two of the movies of a franchise, and then the last one of the trilogy is on another streaming service. Yeah, that's a pain in the ass. Which is really annoying, right? And it is one of the pros to physical media. Now, obviously, physical media has been dying for years. DVD has never really gone away. Blu-ray and DVD are slowly going away. More and more each year statistically. So I'm just collecting my favorite franchises. I know I'm probably alone in that or in the minority anyways. But the fact that Disney Plus now, and we've even seen HBO Max and some other streaming services get IMAX level, 4K Ultra HD level. And when you're a collector like myself and you see, oh, Walmart's got, you know, the steelbook copy of Black Adam or uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, and it's $60 for 4K Ultra HD, or 
I can go on HBO Max, which is a streaming service I already own or subscribe, subscribe to, to. <laughs> and I can watch it there for no extra charge. It is and a get the same quality. It is, you know, as a personal physical media guy myself, I really can't make any more arguments to how this how physical media is going to continue to live on much longer once these streaming services start going towards the route of, okay, here's a new tier in our Disney Plus streaming service where everything is 4K Ultra HD. That will be oh, at I'm some sure that's going to be a thing. It'll be like, it's on the no ads tier. You get it 4K Ultra HD and Dolby Atmos. Exactly. Maybe not in the next couple of years, but it is happening, and it is happening more with Marvel movies this year. Eleanor, you're not like as big into collecting things as me, but what do you think about this whole Blu-ray physical media thing versus digital? Well, I do think physical media will always be important, especially for movies that you can't get on streaming service like, like there are some older movies that I like that are musicals or whatever and you can't find them anywhere or older ship movies and they're not on streaming services. Or if they are, you have to purchase them or rent them. So you might as well just own the physical copy of them anyway. So I have those just so that, you know, I can have them and watch them whenever I want. Don't have to resubscribe to anyone, have to buy anything. Whereas if you don't have the physical media as well, there's also a chance that if the, like, the internet goes out, well, no one else can watch anything because all they do is stream all their stuff. But right. we would still be able to watch stuff because we have it on a disc. <laughs> and especially, I don't know for any of you guys who have children, but if you have children, you better have something for them to watch. Otherwise, they're going to freak out. <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah, I can't imagine like anyone who just streams stuff and has toddlers and your internet goes out, my prayers are out to you because... <laughs> I would be lost without physical media. I mean, there is, like, certain movies that just are better, though, on streaming. Like, like we watched... We have Avengers on physical media. We watched Avengers this summer, but because it was in IMAX quality on Disney+, Plus, we didn't even bother getting out the Blu-ray because we might as well just watch it on Disney+. Plus yeah, if it, it has, War. Yeah, if it has IMAX quality, we might as well just watch it there. And so... You know, we've been noticing over the years that even, like, Redbox is going by the wayside. So physical media really is not much of a thing anymore. Yeah, it's all going to go digital. Like, I'm waiting for it to happen to CDs, too, and stuff like that for music, because music's all going to streaming services as well. So, yeah, vinyl, like, they're making new vinyl records and stuff all the time, but when does that become not popular anymore? And instead of everyone collecting vinyl records because they're hipster cool or whatever, they realize that the sound quality is better when it's on streaming or if it's on a CD and they go back toward that. Because I mean, back when MP3 players were a cool thing that not to age myself or anything, but (laughs) back when MP3 players were cool, that was like, you'd go on your iTunes account and load shit onto your MP3 player. It's like, well, I don't even need the CD now. Right. I got this little thing that just fits in my pocket. Right, because I also had a CD player, and that shit does not fit in your pocket. And if you jog at all, it skips. (laughs) So, I mean, it's better. Batteries pop out. Yeah, it's just better to have that kind of stuff on streaming. And I think movies and TV shows are going that way, too. So it's just going to go to everything being in the cloud, wherever this cloud of data is. And then if it ends up that, like terminator salvation happens or whatever and we all get screwed by skynet well we aren't watching movies anymore anyway but now you don't have access to them (laughs) and you know there there was that that little thing that happened a couple of years ago where people were purchasing movies i believe it was on like the playstation store and their movies started disappearing off of the sony playstation store and that's when some articles came out that was like oh you don't actually fully own your digital movies. Now, I don't know if that is still the case, but I know Amazon Prime was one of the ones that came out that said, yeah, the movies that you buy on our website still are our movies. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. You have my money. But Amazon never took away any digital movies. I've never lost any myself. So, And there were some special circumstances surrounding 
I think it was one specific as well. service too on PlayStation. Right. So and I don't remember which service it was. If anyone knows what it is, let us know in the comments because I remember the situation happening. And I remember you and I being like, What? That is absolute assetry. That's why physical media is the queen, because I own the physical disc. You can't take this out of my hands unless right. you pry it from my cold dead hands. But like I said, nobody's really had that many issues with Amazon, Vudu, Movies Anywhere, all of those movie digital purchasing places, Google, Play Store, right. Apple, whatever. So I do think that obviously digital is going to get better over the years, and they already have been, as we have been talking about. But just for right now, for the Marvel movies on Disney Plus currently that have IMAX enhanced expanded aspect ratio as well as IMAX sound, you have the first Iron Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, Civil War, Doctor Strange, Guardians 2, Thor Ragnarok, Black Panther, Infinity War and Endgame, Am and the Wasp, Captain Marvel, Black Widow, Shang-Chi, Thor Love and Thunder, Eternals, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. And then they threw Lightyear in there uh, just to kind of throw us off. But that's a significant amount of IMAX level Right, movies. you practically and, have a home theater experience if you have the right sound setup and a 4K TV. And it'll never be as good as going to the theater. But it will right. be better than watching your DVD the version. The popcorn will be fresher. <laughs> yeah, the popcorn <laughs> will be better. But your DVD will not be as good as even the digital version, the regular version. Your Blu-ray will be about on par, maybe, as if you have the perfect internet connection. But these IMAX level ones is going to be your best version. It might even be better than the 4K, which a lot of people right. aren't even crazy about 4K anymore. So it is interesting to see, and I am interested to hear what you guys think. Are you a physical media collector, or did you throw those in your backyard bonfire like 10, 15 years ago, and we're just late to the party? Whatever you think, we'd love to hear it down in the comments below. All right, moving on to our third topic, and we are a little late to this story as well, but I thought it was interesting. James Gunn via Twitter has confirmed that this month we'll still be getting a peek at the upcoming DCU slate, which may or may not be acting as a reboot, but that we will not be getting a casting announcement for Superman. Quote, casting, as is always the case with me, will happen after the script is finished or close to finished, and it isn't. We'll announce a few things in not too long, but the casting of Superman won't be one of them. Now, we've known for weeks now that James Gunn is going to be announcing the first few years of his upcoming DCU plan. Uh, roughly the first three years is what sounds like the all reports and rumors are pointing towards of his 8-10 to ten year plan. And we were hoping that because that first movie is going to be Superman, that we're going to be getting a casting announcement soon. That way we can put a picture to this new Superman image in our head that none of us are trying to forget Henry Cavill, at least most of us. And right. so it would be a lot easier pill to swallow if we knew, hey, this guy looks like he could be really great. Or no, this looks terrible and I can just forget all about it and just completely check out and just lose all of my investment. We also don't know what the other films are in the first three-year plan. So what his phase one, if you will, is going to look like, we're going to be getting a better clear picture this month. So that does excite me. But we won't be getting a Superman announcement. Now, I understand why if he's if this is truly the case where... The case for him is that the script needs to be finished. We need to know exactly what kind of Superman we are writing in order to cast that perfect Superman. We don't want to cast somebody because he's handsome and then get halfway through the script and realize, ah, oh, this needs real strong emotional acting and this handsome looking dude just doesn't have the chops. So I understand his rational or his way of thinking regarding not announcing a casting announcement or not even going for casting at this time until the script is finished, and apparently it isn't. They will be announcing a few things in the not too long, so I am excited for that, but I am going to be honest, I am a little disappointed that we're not getting any new Superman news. 
especially because I am a big Henry Cavill fan. I did feel a lot of disappointing feelings, as well as I'm sure a lot of you feel. I know Eleanor feels. But Eleanor, you hear all of this. Superman casting won't be one of the new announcements this month, but we'll be getting something. What do you think about all of it? Well, first of all, I bet you he's going to be like most employers, and he's going to give us the announcement on January 31st, just like employers give out W-2s <laughs> on that day. Yeah, right. So I think that's when we're probably going to get it, because I was expecting by now that we'd already know. Like, when he said it, it'll be early, like, I don't know if he said early in January, but he said it'll be in January. I'm like, okay, so New Year's, we're going to have, like, a New Year's present from him, because he's been just smashing all of our hearts to pieces with this Henry Cavill thing. And it's been relatively quiet. Like, James Gunn, Gunn hasn't necessarily been quiet, and we'll get into that later, but it's been relatively quiet for all of the things that have been going on. But it is disappointing that we're not going to get anything about Superman, because you'd think, if you're going to take Henry Cavill away, at least have the script done enough that you can give us something else to look forward to, or to be like, nah, about I do think it's smart, however. I do have to, you know, give credit where credit is due. That you don't want to put your cart before your horse. So you want to get your script written, get an idea of what kind of Superman you're looking for before you go out and get that casting call out there. And I just hope that they don't go for, you know, somebody super-duper young that is super-duper handsome and just, like, a you know, like a good looking person right. just for that role. I hope that they go for somebody that has some depth because Superman is a character that deserves that and has been around for such a long time and has already been played by so many greats. It's going to be hard to live up to Christopher Reeve, Brandon Routh and Henry Cavill. It's going to be hard to get past that. So if you just cat like cast some random dude, who's just like, yeah, he's the latest star that's up and coming. Like, I've seen, like, I think the guy, forgive me if I mispronounce his name, but Timothy Chamelet or something like that, and he's some really popular actor, and everyone's, like, fan casting him to do different roles and shit, and I'm like, I just hope they don't take a fan casting and just roll with it just because the guy looks like the person. It's like, you just gotta go with... Whoever's the best... Right. ...for that role. Whoever's the best for the role, exactly. Like... When you look at Christian Bale originally, you wouldn't necessarily peg him for Batman, but then he did a great job as yeah. Batman. Like, there's a lot of times where that happens, so I think I'd rather they do something like that, where you just get an actor maybe we've never heard of, somebody who hasn't done much, maybe smaller roles, or take somebody off Broadway, and then go that route. And I hope that we do get an announcement at least sometime this year, like... Maybe in the next few months they'll give us an idea of what they've got going on. Because, yeah, we're all left in the dark right now. And I think we're all getting a little antsy. Because we haven't gotten the slate announcement, which we're all waiting for. The three-year slate plan. They haven't said anything about Superman. They took something away. We're not getting anything back right now. So everyone just feels kind of betrayed, I think. At least that's how I'm feeling. I don't know if anyone else is... Like, let me know what you guys think, if you agree with me. But... I think that it just feels like they took away something. We're not getting any of the benefits back. We're not seeing where this plan is going yet. It just feels like, it almost feels like a train wreck, and we're all just watching it happen, and we're like, um, are they going to call the rescue team in, or is this train wreck just going to keep wrecking? When does this stop? And so I think we're all just waiting for when we can all take a breather, get the slate plan, See who's going to be playing Superman. Maybe see where they're taking, you know, you have to have the Holy Trinity. You got to have Batman. You got to have Wonder Woman. You got to have Superman. So let's see where they're taking the Trinity and then move on from there and branching out into the other characters. Maybe some more of the main Justice League characters. But I'm hoping they go from the main stable, maybe throw in some oddballs in there. Like I know they're probably going to throw Lobo in there, something like that. But I would like to see them expand, do kind of what they did with the MCU, where you have your main stable of your Avengers and you branch out from there. So I'm hoping they do something like that. You know, each movie does take different amount of time to film and post-production. It's all different depending on the amount of visual effects, right? I mean, we've right, seen... visual effects artists are so backed up right now, too. Yeah, we've seen sequels to movies come out in like two years We've seen them in a year if they're planned smart. And 
then we've also seen movies like Aquaman and Aquaman and Lost Kingdom. There's going to be like four or five years between those two movies, right? I don't even remember the first Aquaman. I'm going to have to rewatch it before <laughs> right? I see it. So my question is, is that if we're not close to being done with this Superman script and Superman is going to be one of the first three, presumably, projects announced. It's also under the assumption that maybe Superman is what they're going to be starting this universe out with. And then everything else would kind of fall into place around him if you can get Superman right. If you're not close to being done with the script, we've seen James Gunn write scripts super quick, especially for Peacemaker. He wrote it, shot it, produced it real quick. I don't know if he can do it as fast with a movie. And my question is, even if it's not the first movie, even if it's the third movie in this new DCU timeline, we could be looking around three more months till the script's done, six more months till the script done, a year. If he takes the time like Matt Reeves has done with the Batman, I mean, between Matt Reeves announced as the Batman to the point where it came out was a long time. And between the amount of time that it was just in the script stage was enormous. So my question is, he could be, yeah, announcing a few projects, but he'd never said when those projects were going to come out. We have nothing slated for 2024, as far as I remember. I believe even Blue Beetle is scheduled to come out this year. So we're getting Shazam, we're getting Aquaman, we're getting Flash, Flash, Blue Blue Beetle, Beetle all this year, unless something gets delayed Inevitably, it could. But as of right now, we don't have anything for 2024. So even if they announced Superman casting announcement, script, movie, here's what it's going to be by, let's say, June of 2023. Is there any chance that they're going to have any movie in summer of 2024? Probably not. I mean, that's only a year so I mean, maybe there's a shot. Maybe maybe, Christmas maybe late of 2024. 2024. But I think there's a good chance that maybe James Gunn, Peter Safran say, look, we want to give it some more time and space away from the DCU. We want to disconnect it even more. 2024 is going to be a DC movie free year. Wouldn't that be a tough blow to DC fans? Now, I'm just spitballing. I'm just speculating. We all watch MCU fans have a buffet with all their crap they get to watch. Like, God damn it. There's still a total chance, though, that, like I said, James Gunn was very fast with his TV series, and he already said he was working on a secret one that nobody knows about. So there is a chance that maybe we'll be uh, carried over on the TV side until things change change and we'll probably be getting second season of peacemaker but this is all just speculation we don't know anything we'll all know in the next few months hopefully when this announcement comes or i guess it should be at the end of this month but who knows whatever you guys think about it let us know in the comments below as we'd love to hear your thoughts now moving on to our fourth and final topic Has James Gunn ruined his public perception? I mean, he has made some very iffy calls, questionable calls, over the last few months, overtaking over DCU. Once a young and -and up-and-coming director had major success early on, helmed two successful movies for the MCU, and showed his talents in the galactic side of Marvel... The Suicide Squad and Peacemaker were huge successes for DC, both critical... Critical successes, Peacemaker was the highest rated DCEU project ever. And then now as the co-CEO of DC Studios, got rid of Henry Cavill, and at least isn't letting Henry Cavill come back. So a lot of people are pissed at him now. A lot of people want the DCEU to continue despite how it has had its shortcomings. And now it seems like the average DC fan is kind of pissed off, irritated, and feeling a little... I don't know, mistreated maybe, or feeling like a little uneasy about what the future road lays ahead. And I am right there with you. Now, I'm not on Twitter attacking James Gunn because that's not going to solve anything. But I'm not on board with everything he's done, even though I am a fan of the Suicide Squad. 
I liked Peacemaker. I didn't think it was the greatest thing that DC's ever done like a lot of people else did. But I liked it. And I, I really liked The Suicide Squad. It's maybe in my top five DCEU movies, but it's not in my top three. And I got a lot of flack for that last year when we put out our DCEU ranking list and people were like, oh, how do you not put James Gunn's The Suicide Squad and Peacemaker? It clearly is number one. We'll I put liked... a link to that for you guys in the description so you can see it if you want. I'll tell you why. Because I liked Man of Steel better. I liked Wonder Woman better. I liked Shazam better. And I liked Aquaman better. I just like those characters more. Now, that's just my opinion. You're totally valid to say the Suicide Squad's number one. I totally could see why. It's very, it pushes the boundaries. It's got great characters, great story, great action, all of it. Good visuals, all of it, yeah. Yeah. I just like Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Batman better. That's just me. Now, I wouldn't say that everything James Gunn, Peter Safran has done in this DCU early stages has been totally out of left field. I kind of saw some of it coming and some of these things that they've been doing the last regime wanted to do or had already done. But we've seen a lot of questionable decisions and we've also seen him come out on Twitter and debunk false claims, which I myself do appreciate to an extent because as far as hearing things like, oh, Wonder Woman's not a part of your plan, he came out quickly addressed, no, of course she is. He came out and said, you know, oh, is Batman not going to be a part of your universe because the Batman and Matt Reeves? No, Batman's going to be a critical part of our DCEU. And if he hadn't came out and said those two things, that two members of the Trinity are are in fact going to be in this DCU, then I probably already would have stopped paying attention. And I think a lot of other people would have as well. However, I do criticize the fact that, like the previous regime, him and Peter Safran have failed to address any of the Ezra Miller drama or the future of the Flash film franchise, and the Flash is my man. The Flash is my favorite character, so I want to know what's going to happen. Of course, they don't owe me an explanation, but I just want to fucking know. As of right now, Eleanor, in your opinion... And just keep that in mind. Everything I've said is my opinion, your opinion, your perception of James Gunn currently to this day. How are you feeling? I think he, has, he hasn't he has totally ruined it. No, I don't think. But I do think his public perception is far worse than it has been in quite some time. He did have some controversy in the past that we're not going to get into. Um, but he recovered from that. And I think some of that, um, you know, it's all just old news at this point. But I personally think that Twitter has gotten too big as, like, a, quote, news source. And I think that James Gunn, not just James Gunn either, lots of people need to stay away from using Twitter as their platform to be a news source or to answer controversy. Because I think it makes things messier. Twitter has always just been a very messy website. It's always been known for... Right having drama and having controversy and stirring the pot. And sometimes it doesn't make things better. It makes things worse. And I think in this case, there are some times, like you said, where he clears things up. But I don't think that needed to be done on Twitter. You could have had a press release. You could have had, a, you know, like, they have these people that do, oh, what are they PR called? teams. Yes, PR teams. Thank you. Public relations. You could have your PR team release a statement for you. It seems more professional and it can get your words out there to the news outlets directly. And, you know, it, it denies all these things without going through Twitter where everyone, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry can leave their comments about it and say, no, this isn't true or no, this isn't true. And everyone can debate it and it just gets bigger. So I personally, if I were James Gunn, I'm not James Gunn. And again, this is just my opinion. If I were James Gunn, I would pull a Peter Safran and I would go quiet on Twitter. Yeah, because look at Kevin Feige. Right. And in the past, Twitter has not been good for several people, including James Gunn. It has burned so many people. Twitter, the things that you say on Twitter will come back to bite you in the ass. It always will. And it's done that for so many creators, so many people in the movie industry, music industry, you name it. Politicians, anyone. It's come back and it's bitten them. So... All I'm saying is Twitter has always been a dumpster fire. Don't add gasoline to the dumpster fire. 
just close your laptop. Get a, If you have something where you're seeing this and you're like, no, 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 this isn't true. Gather all the information you need to. Give it to your PR team. Have them make a statement for you. Comes off so much more professionally. And it can be, it may not be answered that evening like it would be on Twitter. You can deny it that evening. But the following morning. Your fans would then know through the Hollywood Reporter, through Deadline, through whoever, that no, this isn't true, according to a PR statement from James Gunn. And I think it would come across a lot better. Granted, the thing that he is doing is smart from a business standpoint, because look at James Cameron. He gets a little messy right before his movies come out, gets us all talking about James Cameron. People go see Avatar. He makes boot go bucks. Right. It's very smart. <laughs> So, like, Paris Hilton said this, and I've always thought it was good, like, good advice from her. One of the small things, but that she said was, even bad attention is good attention, and it gets you <laughs> the attention that you want for your brand. So she always said, you know, yeah, people can hate on me on Twitter or whatever, or they can hate on me on YouTube or whatever site that they're hating on Paris Hilton. She's like... But they're still staying at Hilton Suites. They're still buying my clothing brand. They're still doing this. So, I mean... That's a good point. He is getting DC's name out there. But I just don't know if it's the kind of attention that DC should be garnering. Because DC's already had this type of negative attention in the past. And if you don't want to have a community that is riddled with, you know, toxicity, anger, sadness, all these negative feelings, I think that being a little more professional, a little more low-key about it, might be better. Though I do think something his PR team and him do need to address with Peter Safran and maybe even David Zaslav is they need to definitely tell us what the hell is going on with Ezra Miller. Because we all thought that Amber Heard was a problem. Oh, no, 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 no. Ezra Miller has blown it out of the water. Oh, and, by far. I mean, and not getting into all of that that they've done or the mental health issues, any of that, because it is very sad and I hope they get help. But I just don't think that that's a good look for DC either. And they need to... For a superhero. Right. And they need to address it. Are you keeping this this person around? Are you not? What is going on? Give us an update on that. Sure. Cool. Wonder Woman's going to be in the plan. I never doubted that Wonder Woman was going to be in the plan at some point. But what the hell are you going to do with Ezra Miller? That's the important thing. Instead of tiptoeing around that when there's a giant elephant in the room and being on Twitter and avoiding that... We need to address this and get off of Twitter. Confirming and debunking everything else but Ezra Miller. Right. And that's why I'm thinking, is Warner Brothers saying don't say anything? Probably. And if so, that's also a shady-ass move from Warner Brothers. And my message to David Zaslav is, if you want a better look for your brand, be upfront. Be honest. Say what you're going to do. Because people appreciate honesty more than they do secrets. Even if the honest truth is something that is not what they want to hear, they appreciate hearing the truth over being lied to. And so I'm just hoping that at some point they will come out with this. And Twitter has just always been messy, so I just don't think that it's good for James Gunn. I just really hope that, you know, let's learn from the past of many other people in, like, their past mistakes, and let's move forward I mean, let's get off Twitter. Let's just... At least until you can give us an announcement, until the DC right. fandom can take a breath. Let it mellow out a little bit. And and give us some insight and knowledge into what we're going to be getting. Because right now, all you're leaving us to do... it And some fans who feel more like you and even are more angry than you feel like he's kind of trolling on Twitter. He feel kinda, like he's I see that. nitpicking yeah. and answering things that he wants to to add to the speculation when he wants to, and then debunking things that he knows is going to get out of control. I'd what say about the Ezra Miller thing? Isn't right. it getting out of control? There's one person I say who can troll really well on Twitter and gets away with it, and it's perfect, and it's Ed Boon from Mortal Kombat. Right. He's great with trolling on Twitter, and he does it appropriately, and he doesn't have all the shit that he has to avoid either. it's just either. once in a while, too. Right. It's not every day or I feel like every week. James Gunn is just... he. I can see why people think he's trolling, because it definitely does sometimes feel like this is like 
are you laughing at us? This is almost laughable to you. Like, why are you obviously you're seeing all these tweets because you're answering random people that have like three followers, people that don't that aren't famous, that don't have a verified blue check mark. Mm -hmm. So you're answering these random people and you're not answering everyone's questions. People will say, What about Ezra Miller? Some that, of the bigger crickets. questions. Crickets. But I will say in his defense that I do like a leader that is willing to go into the fire despite how hot it's going to be right now of all times and debunk some of the crazier rumors like Wonder Woman's not going to be a part of your plan, like Batman might not be part of your plan. I do still want to hear more about Superman. I still want to hear more about Justice League. I still want to know, is Zachary Levi going to stay on as Shazam? What's going to happen with Jason Momoa as Aquaman? Is he going to be Lobo? I still want to keep him as Aquaman. I think, honestly, by the end of this year, we're going to know about the future for all of these characters. And unfortunately, it, for some of them, it might be before the release date of those films. And for everybody other than Ezra Miller, I think that's undeserving. Because you look at Justice League, the theatrical cut, everybody knew Ben Affleck was out as Batman. He was not going to be directing and starring in the Batman. And that totally dampered kind of the vibe of going in to see that movie right, you're for like, a well, lot of people. This is the last time I'm seeing Ben Affleck. This sucks. You do that for Shazam and the Fury of the Gods, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. It's going to damper the feeling going into that movie, the hype to see those characters. Because you know you're never going to see them again. And it's not set up to be a finale. It's set up to be the sequel. Right. For The Flash, I don't even want to know. Maybe they can continue on with a different character and just... I, I, who knows if it's a flashpoint storyline? I think everything is kind of riding on that movie, depending on how the story's written. A lot of people are speculating maybe they push it back to, you know, after Blue Beetle, if Blue Beetle's part of the DCEU, maybe they push it back after Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. That way, the end of the DCEU would end on flashpoint, and that way that franchise would basically end on a reboot, kind of like if they ended the X-Men franchise on Days of Future Past, for instance. I think that would be the smartest thing to do. Flashpoint kind of did reboot in a yeah, while. Yeah, it did. It, it did rebooted and rebirth. launched. Yeah. And, or New 52. Right. And so I think that would be the smart thing to do. But unfortunately, I don't think they're going to do that because when we hope for the smart thing with the DCU, right. but it doesn't happen. <laughs> do we also want the Flash to get pushed back another six, seven months? No. At least I don't. No, because then at some point there's going to be something else that happens in, in between. Don't even <laughs> start. Don't even start. <laughs> we hope not. Knock on wood, y'all. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, all I could say in James Gunn's defense, because I am a fan is that I do appreciate him confirming and debunking some of these things. I do think he should stay off until he has an announcement to give us. Maybe work on your script more before debunking all of these things and tweeting as much as you have been. But the question is, is how has all of this affected the perception of James Gunn? There's always going to be the Marvel fans that don't care about anything he's done with DC, so they just judge him off of his Marvel work and his previous work. Then there's the DC fans that are agreeing with every step of the way and disagreeing with every step of the way. And then there's the people that are like me that are somewhere in the middle, I think. I do think that right now, James Gunn, his perception has been damaged, but not beyond repair. I think that him and Peter Safran can lead this to a good place, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. And if anybody can pull it off, other than Kevin Feige, it might be the two of them. Because they've done great work in the past. I just don't necessarily agree with all of their methods at the moment. But I'm okay with waiting and seeing for a little bit. If they want to give us a year with no DC films, that'd be really shitty. But if that means we're going to get high-quality films after and they're going to be pumping them out at a steady pace, I'm okay I don't know. How are you, what do you think of that? I do agree with you. I, I think he has damaged his public perception, but I don't think it's irreparable. I think, you know, you can still come back from this. And even if you don't get off Twitter, I think he could still come back from this. And I think, you know, if they are going to give us better 
quality movies and you need to take a year off, then do so. Because I would rather have quality over quantity. And if you can get me a year off, but then give me quality and quantity, double thumbs up. Then I'll, I'll be there for it. But I'm just hoping for the best. Alrighty, guys, that will be it for this week's episode of the Speed Force Media Podcast. If you are watching on YouTube, please make sure to give us a like, leave us a comment, and please subscribe. Maybe ring that bell if you're feeling fancy. And if you are on an audio-only version, then you know, subscribe, leave us a five-star review. We are on Spotify, Amazon Music, Samsung Podcasts, as well as other podcasting services. Tune in on Saturday for Slasher Saturday, our horror movie podcast. We will be covering Friday the 13th, part three. And thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful day. Have a great week. And remember to iron your capes.